Boardroom Bound, Episode 50, Building Awareness Behind Boardroom Gender Equality, with Kirsten Barnett. CEOs of competitive companies these days want to be fostering a diverse and inclusive work environment, and they know that, you know, produces innovation and that they're in a war for talent, and, um, and, and that helps keep them competitive. But, but I also think that they, they don't really know where they are or how to do better or Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Kirsten Barnett and she is the global head of Bloomberg's Gender Equality Index. And this is a first-of-its-kind performance barometer for gender equality at publicly held organizations. And it tracks the financial performance of companies leading in data transparency and excellence as it relates to women. And she is also the co-founder and on the steering committee of the U.S. 30% Club, which is a group of chairmen and CEOs committed to better gender balance at the board level. Part of how she was positioned to do this is because she was previously the deputy chief of staff to Bloomberg's chairman. She has been at Davos and other leading organizations and has seen what happens behind closed room doors, the conversations that people are having about wanting to bring more diversity into the boardroom. And I'm very excited to bring those frank and candid conversations to you today, as well as hearing the way Bloomberg is helping to publicize this, and it is quickly moving up on the radar and what people are seeing and talking about. So let's jump into the show and hear about it from Kirsten. Kirsten Barnett, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm thrilled because there's so much that we can cover today from uh, meaty things that you're doing today, plus earlier roles that you had. And and I think it'll be fascinating for our audience. Uh, you're not the typical person on our show in the sense of you're, you're not sitting on a board today, yet you're doing so much in the board space and so much that uh, shapes what is happening in the boardroom, right? So some of your, your one of your prior roles was chief of staff, uh, deputy chief of staff, the Bloomberg chairman, big deal in and of itself. Uh, leading the 30% club for the US, big deal. Uh, th- the fact that you have the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, you're leading, big deal. Um, let's start at the beginning. How did you end up going into this space and touching all these different parts that impact the boardroom? Yeah, it's interesting. I was actually working on kind of the corporate governance space before I was in the women's space, um, which is unorthodox. But as you mentioned, I was uh, chief of staff to our our chairman, Peter Grauer, um, for I think six or seven years um, before my current role running our gender equality index. And in that role, um, I mean, it was amazing. We we did, you know, 20-something countries a year. Um, I really got to learn how a global business is run, um, but also a- about co- kind of corporate governance and what it takes to be running a, a you know, global corporation, um, operate, you know, abiding by rules in each market, and also just making sure you're, you know, protecting the assets of your shareholders. And uh, and Peter also sat on a couple of public company boards at the time. Obviously, Bloomberg is private. Um, and one of the things he helped co-found with the World Economic Forum was the Community of Chairmen, which is a, a group of um, non-executive and executive chairmen from around the world. And they get together a few times a year in Davos and, and elsewhere um, and really just flush out sort of different corporate governance environments, um, things like board refreshment and board diversity, but also things like reputational risk. And um, and one of the common themes in all those discussions, uh, which I was fortunate enough to, you know, sit in on for, for a few years, um, was that while many markets are very different and you have some markets where there's more, you know, family-owned structures or, or large public company structures, um, the, the importance of who's on your board is, is really what kind of makes or breaks the company. And so whether you take the example of, you know, if you're BP and the oil spills, like you don't really think of boardroom diversity in that sense, but the people around that table are who, are who going to, you know, determine how your company comes out of a crisis like that. And mm-hmm. so I, it was interesting to see that in all of the different discussions they were having, 
this common theme of ensuring that, you know, you're baking the right board, you have the right ingredients in there, um, was throughout. And I think that that just really goes hand in hand with this conversation about having women on boards and diversity of thought on boards and experience. And now we're talking a lot more about age diversity um, because you really just can't talk about any of these other issues affecting a, a board or challenges that boards are having to face without talking about the people that are sitting around that table. And, and that resonates with me. My first significant board experience was walking into a room that was very pale, male, and stale. And I remember thinking, <laughs> this is, it's going to be hard to innovate here. Not that we couldn't do it, but I think it'd be easier to innovate if we had some, uh, whether you think uh, age or gender or socioeconomic background around the table. I think it just allows for that different discussion. Yeah, and I think gender always, always, you know, comes up a lot in this conversation, not because it is important to think of the others, but because gender is something we can measure across, you know, consistently across the board, no matter where you are in the world. And it's also um, something that is a challenge around the world. I mean, we don't see equal boardroom representation anywhere. You don't see it in Nordic countries, which generally are, you know, much better about um, equal benefits and equal paid leave and other things like that. Um, you don't see it clearly here in the U.S. You don't see it in Asia. And so it's interesting that, that this continues to be such a struggle, and yet we only see more and more women in all of these markets that are qualified to be sitting on these boards. These boards are operating in the most complex environments that they ever have. The challenges have never been greater. And yet you often still see that, you know, a, a board full of white men that all are either former or sitting C- mm-hmm. CEOs and and it's hard to know what you're missing if, if, you know, everybody looks the same. Well, maybe this is a great segue to talk about what you're doing today, which I just find so fascinating. So Bloomberg's Gender Equality Index, which, you know, from my impression is really a first of its kind performance barometer for gender equality at publicly traded organizations. I would love to hear how did this come about? I think we look at that now and go, that makes sense. Shouldn't we have that? But it, it didn't exist for, for forever. What, what happened? How did it go? How is it going? Yeah, you know, the first time I thought about kind of this concept of additional metrics um, was actually when when we were launching the 30% Club here in the U.S., uh, Helena Morrissey, who's the founder of the 30% Club globally, and I were talking about, you know, what do we want to set as the target, um, the consistent theme throughout 30% Club chapters around the world are that they all work with a measurable target. I think people, you know, work well, you know, with something to work towards, Um and we were saying, should it be 30%, should it be S&P 500, should it be S&P 100? Um, in the UK, it had been 30% on, on FTSE 100 boards. And, you know, I remember saying to Helena, you know, I think in the U.S., what's interesting is that, you know, probably boardrooms are talked about less as far as what's going to have an impact on, you know, pulling women through the pipeline. And wouldn't it be great if we could set a target around the C-suite or the executive level? Because I think that's what people see more. And... You know, Helen and I then kind of looked at each other and went, but there's no consistent way to measure that. Mm. <laughs> right now, the only thing we could measure, uh, you know, fairly and consistently was boardrooms. And it's very easy to say, okay, two people out of, out of 10, that's 20%. Three people out of 10, that's 30%. Um, and, and when you looked below that, it got a little blurry. And I actually remember um, me and, and someone on, on my team, we went and looked at, as an exercise, the S&P 100, and we went on their websites and we pulled all of their essentially executive officers that they would list, and most had anywhere from four to ten, um, and we and made a list of all their roles and then tried to, to try and see if there were consistent roles that everyone listed and maybe we could use that as a target. And I remember this Excel sheet she made. It was like 45, you know, rows, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it was 45 columns long with all these different titles and that it was, you know, CFO, CEO, but then it was like chief digital officer, right. chief marketing officer, chief organizational officer. And and there wasn't any consistency. And we realized, yeah, in, in order to be fair, we're going to have to stick to the boardroom until we have another way to measure this. And so what's funny is that five years later, it's kind of coming back full circle. I'm now leading our gender equality index, which we developed a standardized reporting framework for companies to be able to disclose on metrics throughout their organization that are affecting women in their workplace and, and in the communities in which they operate. And th- this is exactly what you know we need. I think the next phase of the 30% club here, we're going to be able to use other targets, like, for example, of the top 10% compensated people at your um, company, what percent of those are women? Like, to me, that tells a really interesting story about what's happening inside of a company, whereas while it's important to have parity at your boardroom, that's just one metric. 
And I think that's fabulous. And I've never heard anyone describe it in exactly the same way. And I've always thought about it. There's this sort of chicken egg scenario that happens. You talked about a lot of boards are sort of males who are sitting or former C-level executives. Um, And the knock on women was, well, you haven't been the CEO of the public company. There's not many of those seats to begin with, first of all. And they might have been right below that, running a whole division, running a P&L, the equivalent experience, we could easily say. Um, And it's this sort of scenario of like, how do you get the job that experience? How do you get the experience without a job? Certainly qualified to be in the boardroom based on that experience. And so, for example, I'm on 2020 Women on Board Steering Committee. And so they've got the 20 number instead of the 30% number. And it's the same sort of idea. It's visible. It's obvious. Can you see that change there? And it will filter down. But you could also argue now that we're really seeing the needle move in the boardroom, we're still not seeing it change much in the C-suite below it. Both are incredibly important. And I, I like your background and honest story about why you went for the boardroom because you could actually measure it and track it. Yeah, I mean, you can't really hold yourself accountable, let alone others, if you don't have a way to measure progress. So I think that that is important, um, and I think we made the right decision sticking to the board at the time. But I do think that, you know, as you said, we're not seeing a lot of pro- progress below the boardroom. But to be honest, we don't really know how much progress we, we are seeing. We know it's not enough because we can look around, but um, I think that, you know, a lot you have a lot of executives out there, a lot of CEOs out there that the business case for diversity is not new. I think most CEOs of competitive companies these days want to be fostering a diverse and inclusive work environment, and they know that, you know, produces innovation and that they're in a war for talent, and um, and, and that helps keep them competitive. But but I also think that they, they don't really know where they are or how to do better or how to measure it. And, um, and when you think about often metrics around this have been designed for the HR community, and they were more around, like, what does your company consider seniors so that you can hold yourself accountable? But there's no way to really measure against your peers, because the, what I consider senior, you know, could be 1,000 people. What you consider senior might be 10 people. And so we had to kind of create a, a way of um, standardizing that and making sure we're normalizing those metrics in order to make companies feel safe about putting out this information in front of investors, which is what Bloomberg does. Um, and I think we're doing, you know, a, a, a decent job at that. And I'm excited to see that there's a lot of big companies reporting on metrics, both that they're proud of, but also reporting numbers and saying, you know, we're not where we want to be on our pay gap. We don't have as many women in, in senior leadership roles as we want or revenue roles or engineering roles. But here's what we're doing to fix that. And I think it's important to be able to see that the full story of what's happening in organization rather than to just focus at the board level, um, because you, uh, otherwise you're really going to be missing a lot. And it's really interesting the way you've described it. So I'm going to call this an evolution of what I think uh, historically when I was coming up through the ranks in the corporate world is you would see, you know, you'd see the national rankings for best places for women to work or, or veterans of the services or whatnot. And I remember when I was in my consulting days, one of the companies I was working with, the CEO was very proud. He had just gotten number six for their company, the best places for women to work. And I said, congratulations. What are you going to do next year? He goes, oh, we're not going to be at it next year said, what do you mean? He goes, I could never get higher than this. It costs so much money to get here. I'm going to have to pull myself out of the rankings. Otherwise, we're going to see ourselves drop. And I was floored by that response. I, part of me gets from an analytical perspective what he's saying. I don't think that was the right message to be sending. Um, clearly, this is a, a very different perspective from that. Do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that. I had a similar experience um, when I when I took on this role. And I remember sitting talking to some large public organization and they said, um, or public company, and they said, oh, by the way, how much does it cost to submit data to Bloomberg? Mm. And I said, cost? Like, oh my gosh, this is not a pay to play. How, you know, this is a really important metric. How could you possibly, you know, um, but, it, but it's interesting because I've grown up at Bloomberg. Data is, we don't do everything well. Data is something we do do well on objective data. So it didn't really even occur to me we would never ask companies to pay us to put their financial data on the terminal. Why would we ask them to pay us to put, you know, their people data on the terminal? Um, but it, that is an interest, interesting thing. And, and another thing about that story that strikes me is the rating factor. So many companies have told me what they like about um, the GEI or Gender Equality Index. And our framework is that, you know, they don't, give us a whole bunch of, of numbers, and then we spit out a score. And you might say, well, wait, I was fifth last year, I'm seventh this year, what happened? Or if I'm looking, comparing those companies as a potential employee, I don't know if that means they all, the person who's number five or the company number five has better benefits and, you know, more women and a great culture or how everything was weighted. And I think rather than us make that assumption for people um, and for investors in our case, you know, we put out all this raw data. Another big question that I get from companies is, so I'll give you the data, you give me a score. And I say, 
we'll, we'll give you a few scores, but also all of your data goes on the terminal. So don't give it to us if you don't want every <laughs> investor to be able to see it. And that, that was something that a lot of companies just couldn't get comfortable with because most of these scoring models just weren't structured that way. Um, and so I think that's where Bloomberg, you know, has helped bring transparency to this conversation. Um, it's important data to have out there, but it's also important, you know, for people to be able to use it different ways. I might care more about, you know, the overall representation of women in the workplace, and I want to see 60% women or something like that. Or I might want to see, you know, that pipeline ratio be closest to one-to-one. So if you only have 30% women in your workforce, but you have 30% at the most senior level, I might be happier with that. It's not, neither way is right or wrong. It's just that, you know, we, so we want to put out all of this data and then help investors use it in their own way and digest it to make informed uh, investment decisions. I think that's a great way to describe it because we can have statistics and we can analyze it and we can come up with different conclusions. And the comparison I will use to break it down for our audience, I work at Gordon College, and every year when the U.S. News list of national ranking schools comes out, everyone's sitting there and parsing the numbers and how did this one move up and this move down and what does it mean and how does it work and we'll endlessly be debating it but I imagine a big part of it is you want to have debate you want people having that discussion and thinking about what's right for their organization how do we move how do we change things I imagine that was one of your initial goals exactly and you know it's interesting I think, think something about um, oh sorry hold on sorry. Exactly. And I think another interesting thing right now is that companies are taking all of this seriously because they know this is attracting talent, both both mm-hmm. male talent and women talent, particularly when you look at millennials. But in the same sense, just like investors, talent doesn't all value the same thing either. I might be more interested in, you know, parental leave benefits. Another person, you know, might be dealing with elder care challenges. Um, so again, the reason you, you can't just say it's a great benefits package. I think, you know, there's no such thing as a modern family anymore and you need workplaces that are reflecting that. Um, when we ask about parental leave, we ask both primary and secondary. And then we also ask about usage because particularly with secondary, which is often paternity leave, you might see a really great policy, but if none of the men feel comfortable taking it, then then that says something about the corporate culture backing it up. So you you need, you know, that's the way these issues are so complex because every t- you're like playing whack-a-mole. Every time you think you've, you've got something, you then have to kind of delve one, you know, one layer down. It's great to have the policy, but you also need to make sure you have are fostering a culture that encourages employees to take it. Absolutely. I was I had one of my good friends over who works at Deloitte recently, and we were having a conversation, just had his third kid, and I said, how's your summer going? How are you adjusting? He goes, great. I've been off for three months. I said, what are you talking about? He's like, we have four <laughs> months of, of paternity leave, which shocked me, and I couldn't believe it. Not only that they had it, but he was able to take it. And I said, well, you're pretty senior on your way to partner now. He goes, yeah. And you, you're you okay? You're going to be allowed to do this? It's not going to hurt you? He said, well, I checked with five senior partners, and I said, off the record, am I really allowed to use this? Is this really okay? It's not going to hold back. He said, no, we really encourage that. And he thought about it for a long time before he realized it. And he said, now he believes it. That is not normal. First of all, to have it. And second of all, to be able to yeah. take it. Well, and the other interesting thing about, about men taking parental leave is that because it, it, it has been a relatively new type of benefit for companies to have, you know, men don't see their superiors uh, taking, uh, sorry, excuse me, men don't often see their superiors taking leave. Because if you think about sometimes your most senior people in the company might not be at the age of which they're having right. small babies. Um, and But without having that history of watching everyone else take it, and particularly those you know to whom you look for direction on what's okay and acceptable, that's, I think, where things get stuck. And so you might have a whole bench of senior management that really wants the men and women in their workforce to take full advantage of their leave. But because the men haven't seen it, you know, you just have to find another way to make sure that they know it's encouraged and to role model people that have. And and I think that, yeah, that's a, it's a tricky one. Well, I think that also just ties back with a larger goal of, let's say, diversity in the C-suite and the boardroom. If you have people of different ages, different genders, different backgrounds, you will see different behaviors monitor, whole, monitored and shared, hopefully all good ones. But basically, you will see if you've got some younger people in the C-suite, you will see them going off on paternity leave. And I imagine in some ways, that's a big part of the 30% club, not just getting women on boards, but we're trying to change the culture and the mindset and perhaps allow people to do well while doing good. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. I I think that companies recognize now that, you know, often when you talk about benefits, things like parental leave and others, it always felt like it was uh, something that the employer was absorbing the cost for on behalf of the employee. Whereas nowadays, people understand the the cost of turnover, for example. If, If you have a woman or a man go out on leave for three months and come back and then 
you know, depart the company, you, you've lost a significant amount of money on that employee. Not only have they been gone where you didn't have someone in the role for three months, but now you have to have the cost and the time to fill them and train someone new and, and all that. And so I think people now realize it's more of a balance of you're not just doing these as a, as a nice to have for your employees. You're doing these because this is, this is smart when it comes to talent, when it comes to staying competitive. Um, and, and yeah, I, th- I think that, that all comes down to talent. I think when you look at younger talent, particularly in the U.S., you know, we're in the middle of a huge student debt crisis. You're going to see, you know, people aren't going to have the luxury of having only one parent working often or one spouse working. Um, you see people buying homes later, having children later. And so all of these things, it's only going to become more and more important to the men in workforce as well. And I hope that, you know, I have a two and a half year old son. I, I hope that when he enters the workforce, there is no, you know, stigma attached with men taking paternity leave, that these are just things that are standard in companies. Um, and, and then we'll all be, you know, better off for it. Well, I imagine part of what you're doing at 30% Club with such high visibility uh, people that are leading it, right? You think of some of the names involved like Warren Buffett, Larry Fink, Brian Moynihan, Sheryl Sandberg. These are some names we all go, wow, all right, they're really behind something. But the problem is it's not just what the guy at the top of the house is saying, it's also what your individual direct manager is saying. Because if you don't get the same message from both, uh, studies have shown that employees don't necessarily believe it, or at the very least they're confused. And And confusion leads to no, if you can't really know. So part of it is we need these people to be pushing the message down, but I imagine it's also a cultural change. So imagine like the board turnover, the board member's lifespan is multiple years. It may take time for these things to change. Is that how you're thinking about it in some ways playing a long game to help facilitate the change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in general, when you look at, everyone always gets fatigued talking about, you know, the women in senior leadership or women on board issue, because it feels like we've been talking about it for so long. But I think that up until now, a lot of the talk has been sort of the lean-in factor, what women can do to lean into these traditionally male-dominated workplaces, um, raising your hand, having more confidence, all of these things that we hear, which are, are important to know. But I think the 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 other half of the equation is, is the companies leaning in. You need to have an environment that is going to create, you know, a more effective workplace for men and women. And, and that's the piece that, unfortunately, culture is the hardest thing to change. It's also the hardest thing to measure. I mean, we're trying with our, with our disclosure framework and our index, but this is, this is tough stuff. And I think when you talk about Larry Fink and Warren Buffett and um, the 30% Club, there, I think it's important to have those highly respected leaders, voices out there, less so even for their own organization as it is to encourage other boardrooms and other CEOs to think about what, you know, what, what, what it takes to have board refreshment and a diverse board and an effective board. Because I think that they're changing this from a diversity issue to just a mainstream you know, board effectiveness issue. Like this is, you're at a risk if you, all of your directors have been sitting there for 20 years. They're not really independent anymore, are they? And right, also they're right. probably all old and blah, blah, blah. So I think that in the, in the 30% club example, having the voice of those leaders is helping shape, you know, the um, kind of the culture of how we're talking about the boardroom conversation and helping influence CEOs that look up to those companies. I think you're exactly right as far as if you really want to influence what's happening inside of a company, it can't just come from the CEO. The commitment has to come from the CEO. But in order for culture to change, it needs to be, you know, permeated throughout the organization. And you were making a great point before. It's also about advocating for yourself. And a lot of this is about someone who's saying, I want to be in the boardroom. I need to get the role. I need to get the opportunities to do that. But not only getting organizations that are open to those different perspectives, but getting yourself positioned for them and being ready for it. And you and I were talking before, one of the lessons learned you've been saying in your own career in this regard is the difference between a mentor and a sponsor and the danger of you confuse the two. And I think this ties back into what we're talking about now. I'd love for you to expand upon that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, so, so I think that mentors and sponsors are both incredibly important to someone's career. You need both of them. No one told me what those were. I don't really think I knew the word sponsor until a couple of years ago. But once I did learn it, I went, oh, wow, I made a huge mistake. And I, I can think about it um, clear in my career. I wish someone had told me this before, not to confuse them. I mean, a mentor is someone that you go to for advice. You need a lot of them. It's almost like a personal board of directors. You want to go and say, how should I handle this situation? Or, um, I'm thinking about X, Y, Z. I'm at a you know crossroads. What what do you think? Um, a sponsor is someone that you know. A sponsor is not given. You are not entitled to a sponsor. A sponsor is someone that you earn, and you earn their respect and their endorsement essentially. And so, a sponsor is when you're not in the room. That's the person that's going to say, "Oh, new projects coming up. 
Kirsten could do that. And in fact, I know she'd like to do that. And I, I guarantee you she would be good at it. I mean, that's a sponsor. And so the challenge with sponsors is that you, you need them. You need a lot of them. It's how you often get your next role. They, the good thing about them is they don't need to look like you. It doesn't matter. You know, you might want a working woman to, as a mentor to talk to about working mom challenges, but you don't, you don't need uh, a woman to give you your next role. And so while that's the good piece, the bad piece is that you, you don't want them to lose confidence in you for any reason because then they're not going to put your name forward because you might make them look bad. And so when I was traveling with our chairman, I can remember coming back it was in my late 20s, coming back from an Asia trip. We'd been gone for two weeks. We did like nine cities in, you know, what, 14 days. And I was exhausted. Um, and I remember on the flight back telling him, like, oh, I feel like I'm burning out. We've been in so many time zones over the past few months and blah, blah, blah. And I'm so tired. Blah, blah, blah. I haven't seen my family. And then if maybe a week later, a project came along that I would have really wanted to work on. And I thought he would know I would have wanted to work on. And he gave it to someone else. I remember saying to him, because we had a good relationship, and saying, Peter, you know that's an area of interest for me. I've, you know, I've told you that before. And he said, well, yeah, but, but you told me you were burned out. I didn't want to add anything to your plate. <laughs> and I thought, of course, he thought he was doing the right thing. Um, and, and here I was disappointed. And, and of course, you know, anyway, it was just an interesting lesson for me. On, on Peter has been both a sponsor and a mentor to me, but you, you really do need to be careful about who you go to for what. Um, and so set yourself up with the support structure you need, but make sure that your sponsors, those are the people you want to impress. They're also the people you want to be advocating for, um, much like when you're ready to go on a board of directors. You want to tell all of your sponsors that you're ready for the next role, that you're interested in managing a P&L, that you want digital experience, whatever it might be, so that when those things come up, your name comes to be front of mind. And I, I think that ties in with the Jeff Bezos quote that I hear so much about your brand is what's said about you when you're not in a room. And it's said by your exactly. sponsors, right? And you need to arm your sponsors with the information that you need them to have for the future. So you think about it doesn't matter who you know, it's what they know about you that they can then help you with. Absolutely. And it sounds like you've got another great person like that who's in your corner with Helena Morrissey. And you've been talking about her on this podcast. And I know you're a big fan of her book, uh, the A Good Time to Be a Girl, I believe is what it's called. Yeah, Helen is amazing. I mean, the the first my first exposure to her in the 30% Club is I was um, on a business trip in Hong Kong maybe seven or so years ago. And I remember uh, walking to some some event after work and our head of HR was bringing me and, and our chairman over and on the way said, oh, it's a women's thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was a busy day. And I remember getting there and picking my head up and looking around the room and then saying, wait, I thought you said this was a women's thing. I said, no, no, it is. But the, men, the room was full of men. Um, and that's what really piqued my interest. It's the first time I really got involved in anything around kind of a, a, a women's initiative. I always sort of thought of them as being fluffy and a bunch of women talking about how to cook a quick meal or something like that. And then when I, this is what piqued my interest is it looked different. It sounded different. And it was suddenly, it was the people in the position to make change advocating for the change. And they could be men, they could be women, but they needed to be the person in the position to make change. And that was just a, such a different concept that I hadn't really seen layered onto a lot of the existing initiatives. Um, and then the more research I did, the more I realized, wow, there's a lot of things that, you know, my experience in the workplace has not been every woman's experience. There's a lot of things our company can do better and other companies can do better. Um, and Helena has been just such an amazing role model and partner in, in launching the U.S. Club. For, for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with her, um, I recommend you pick up her book, A Good Time to Be a Girl, or, or look into um, some articles on Helena. She's amazing. She is 50 years old. She's the mother of nine children, which <laughs> that alone, I could just stop there, period, end of sentence, and I feel like most people would go, wow. Um, yeah, so mother of nine. Uh, three boys, six girls, no twins, so nine pregnancies. Wow. And she was the CEO of Newton Asset Management, which I think is about a 50 billion um, pound asset management firm based in London. Uh, she was CEO, I don't know, like 40 or something. And she's currently running personal investing at Legal and General. Uh, she founded the 30% Club in all of her free time. <laughs> I right, don't right, right. That, which is now, you know, in, in about 20 different countries around the world. Um, and she's really just this uh, amazing person. And she's also incredibly likable. And she is strong but feminine. And she's just like everything about her. I feel like she has been a really great role model for me to, to, to show me that you can bring your authentic self to work. You can do good in business and also be doing well, you know, for, for society while making your company look good. Um, and you can juggle a lot of balls within a 24-hour day. And, and, you know, I think when I look at Helena, the, the saying 
I'm struck by the saying that you may have heard before that you have just enough time for in a day for everything that's important to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so interesting. I try to think about that now as both, you know, a mother and, and someone who, who works. Um, but when you feel frazzled, it's, you just need to be really ruthless about prioritization and being very intentional around how you spend your time um, and how all the pieces sort of interconnect. But Helen is just a fantastic example of that. And uh, I'm really inspired by her personal story. And I think some of your listeners would be as well. Well, I appreciate that recommendation, and I imagine many of our listeners are inspired by the journey that you have gone through, and we appreciate your authenticity today. And I'm sure there are some that may want to follow your story and your path and learn from it. What would be the best ways for people to be in touch? Yeah, well, so if you go to um, www.bloomberg.com backslash GEI for Gender Equality Index, um, that's where we have a lot of information on both our reporting framework, on our index, and the performance. Um, on we have I've done a series of taped um, interviews with CEOs of some of the companies in our index, including most of the heads of the major U.S. banks, which are really interesting to hear what they're doing and bring that data to life and learn what they're doing inside of their companies. Um, and and it also has contact information on there how to get in touch with our team. But um, yeah, we're excited about what the data is showing and the performance, even though it's early days. And hopefully, again, by the time I send George's in the workforce, we won't have to. We won't have to prove that, you know, companies that, that invest in women are going to perform equally, if not better. It will just be the norm. Well, as you've just told us, there's only enough time today to, to make what happens, uh, make what happen, what matters to you happen. And we appreciate you thinking about that for your son, right? You're planning ahead for the future and your goals, trying to make that work. So we were delighted to have you on the show today, Kirsten. Thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Kirsten Barnett. It was wonderful to hear from someone who helped found the U.S. 30% Club, which is an amazing collection of people. When you think about the talent leading companies that's involved with that, you're talking about the Warren Buffett, Larry Fink, Brian Moynihan, Sheryl Sandberg, these sorts of people that are leading the change movement for diversity in the boardroom. But also hearing how she's working at Bloomberg to raise the profile and the opportunity for people to understand the performance barometer for gender equality at public health organizations. Great to hear from someone who's playing a key part in this space. Now, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you will find links to everything that we talked about today. And please know the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you miss any of the high quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound.